Hello, everybody. My name is Sharon, and I work with the team at the Lyme Disease Association of Australia. And we're here for May 2024, again, representing patients in Australia who are sick and current, current and existing patients who are sick after a tick bite or uh, have multiple unrecognized or difficult symptoms. And we're very privileged today to have Dr. Armin Schwartz back. And I'll just give you many, he'd be very familiar to many of you, but I'll give you a little bit about his background. Dr. Schwartzbeck is a specialist for laboratory medicine and infectious diseases from Augsburg, Germany. He's been working in the field of diagnostic tests for Borrelia burgdorferi and co-infections for more than 20 years, and has tested more than 50,000 patients for different tick-borne diseases and multiple infections. Having acquired a broad range of expertise, Dr. Schwartzbeck recognized the problem of insensitivities, insensitivities and lack of standardization with regard to Borrelia burgdorferi, antibody ELISA, and immunoblot tests. He compared the test results in conjunction with typical symptoms for Lyme disease and developed a correlation. Dr. Schwartzbeck is a member of the German Borreliosis Society, the Swiss Association for Tick-Borne Diseases, the German Association of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, the German Society for Medical Laboratory Specialists, and the Australasian Integrative Medicine Association. He was very active and vocal during the government medical consultation starting in 2013 here in Australia. He gave testimony and written submissions, has been supporting Australians with testing services since 2015. Dr. Schwartzbeck is a passionate advocate for current and future Australians sick with tick bite and other yet to be recognized infections. So Dr. Schwartz, you said yes immediately and we're so grateful to have you here today. Yes, hello to everybody and uh, thank you for your very engaged group and Sean, what you're doing for this uh, bad thing of a lot of political uh, background behind that and uh, many sufferers in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just list a little admin warning here. My internet sometimes pauses, but I'll still I'll come back. So you just carry on. If I freeze, it's just the internet in this rural area in Australia. It should be okay. So Dr. Schwartzbeck, you, we wanted to speak on your perspective in regards to the global Lyme situation and especially what's impacting us and your perspective about Australia. Yeah, this is a tragedy to name it this way. Um, when I had the first Australian patient in 2007 or eight, it was uh, very early from the beginning. His name was Carl McManus and <clears throat> Carl was sitting in a wheelchair coming to my clinic in Augsburg. So I run a clinic there. It was named the Borreliosis Centrum Augsburg that time. Um, maybe my background, I'm also a clinician, so I'm a medical doctor. I worked in internal medicine, um, so not just laboratory medicine. Uh, so I know a lot about uh, how to diagnose uh, infections because I was also infectious disease doctor in the early 90s. We, we worked um, not with Lyme disease. It, it didn't exist that time, simply. Um, for sure, I misdiagnosed a lot of patients, but we worked um, in Interestingly, with H. pylori, a, a gut pathogen, uh, which was surprisingly surviving in the stomach acid. And we treated it so successfully. I was in the first generation, 1991. Uh, we did eradication, we named that, of this pathogen living in the gut, which was unbelievable. So we rescued a lot of um, cases and a lot of patients not getting cancer from this pathogen in the gut and so on and so on. So I worked also oncology and um, I was oncologist. Um, with cancer patients in this um, diagnosing and treating with chemotherapy. So I know also how to handle with the immune system, how to support it. We had a lot of HIV patients also with opportunistic infection, viruses. So nothing is new to me. But Carl McManus, uh, who came to my clinic in 2007, 2008, so now 16 years ago, he came from Australia and I said, okay, um, Lyme, doesn't exist in Australia. And um, his wife, Moala McManus, and himself, he said, yes, I had a tick bite. He was um, working for Skippy the Bush Kangaroo that time for Hollywood Studios. And he was bitten um, from a tick in, in Australia. And after that, he got very, very sick sitting in a wheelchair. And maybe some of you know the end. Unfortunately, he died, so we could not rescue him. Um, but I diagnosed him with Lyme disease, and I said, oh, wow. And the tests were positive that time and of Australia. But this changed my point of view um, also to care for Lyme patients in Australia. 
Uh, what is the situation? What you asked me? Um, yeah, the situation is um, very conservative in Australia, as it is in Scandinavian countries. Um, uh, so I have a, a good overview, I think, because I'm doing services for, let me say, 1,000, 2,000 clinics all over the world. And we have some liberal uh, situation in some countries, um, as an example, Germany is a liberal medical situation, although we need to be careful, we do, uh, how do we name it, this um, off-label use um, therapies, you know, so it's allowed to do long-term antibiotics here, which is, as an example, not allowed in Australia. And um, 2013, when I came to Sydney for a conference uh, with your uh, health minister, I think he was there. Uh, he he was uh, sitting there and he was very, very interested in this field. So uh, we were invited to Canberra to your uh, government and health authorities. And then uh, the tragedy started, I think so, in 2013. Why? Because um, there were sitting some CDC or FDA guys opposite of me and they said, chronic Lyme, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Uh, you're skeletons, you know? So uh, that, uh, and I said, what's going on? This is not a discussion uh, with you guys. So, but um, as you know, you're surprised, you're shocked, maybe. And let me say, so Australia and the global situation, it's not so bad. Um, we have uh, some positive um, signs from America now with more signs on it. Monica Embers is doing a lot of good signs, as an example. Rich Horowitz did books after that. Islets is growing. Uh, organization nevertheless st still attacked. Um, but uh, in Australia, it's, I think, one one of the uh, worst situations in the world, as it is in Scandinavia, in Norway, uh, if I have an overview about all of these countries. And I'm so shocked that they took licenses of the last um, doctor. They uh, they took the license of, uh, it was not just Peter Main in the end, uh, uh, who, who, whom they pursued. It, it's also G of Kemp. And they, um, they try everybody who name it Lyme disease in Australia to take off the licenses now. So, I don't understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, as you would know so deeply, the patients are suffering and um, we need to keep keep vocal so that we can support the people and find a way around this, the politics, really, because it's not about science or medicine. So one of the things that's really near and dear to your heart is the role of laboratories in regards to tick-borne disease. What's your, what do you see a role past, present and future? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Everybody says we need better tests, but we have very good tests. So this is uh, nonsense. We need a better education uh, because Lyme disease still remains a clinical diagnosis. As it is with a kidney insufficiency, this is also a clinical diagnosis. If you come into a, a coma, so also you need to check maybe your liver enzymes and your kidney results. But clinically, you show symptoms. And so long the doctors and medical students are not educated, we don't come forward. Lyme disease is a clinical, it's not a laboratory test diagnosis, please. We are doing tests for pathogens, and one of these is Borrelia burgdorferi, Sensulato complex, it's named, which has different subspecies, uh, more than the three common ones. Um, we have good tests, and uh, we have but very, very bad tests in the guidelines. The guidelines are bullshit, let me say so. Um, <laughs> when I uh, I work for a huge laboratory like it is your um, Quest and LabCorp and Sonic Healthcare Group. So I worked for Synlab Group in Germany. I was the COO, you would say, for 400 people as a laboratory doctor, microbiologist. So I know all of these disciplines. And um, in 2005, I got a patient with multiple sclerosis and the patient was misdiagnosed. It was, in the end, neuroboliosis, but the antibodies, uh, the ELISA was completely negative. Immunoblot negative, Western blot negative. Um, I, I did this ELISPOT that time. Uh, or uh, let me say a cellular test uh, on that patient sitting in my laboratory. And I, I was not convinced that multiple sclerosis like symptoms, I name it this way, could be Lyme disease or neuroboliosis. Um, and the patient uh, got positive in the test, in the ELISPOT test, and the CD57 cells were low. I have the data still in my some of my presentation. And after that, um, the patient was treated with rosefin. Um, you couldn't imagine 
imagine that. Also, Monica Ambrose published now that paper. She said the best is a combination of therapy clinically to do now more studies on it, a combination of ceftriaxone or sort of cefin plus doxycycline. Although we could discuss about the co-infections where it's not working as an example pretty well and Babesia, it's, it's not working. But uh, I, I, I rescued a multiple sclerosis patient by the support of the doctor. The doctor uh, used that time uh, three weeks or four weeks uh, rosefin. The patient was very, very happy and got healthy, uh, sitting in a wheelchair, jumping out of the wheelchair. Okay, you could say all is neuropsychiatric, but no, the patient, uh, she was a nurse, you know, she, she knew uh, what she was suffering from. But in the end, the therapy was wrong. They used corticosteroids, all of this complexity, immune suppression. Um, it was complete, but I rescued one case and that changed my uh, complete career. I was on a good career in bigger laboratories as it is with the Sonic Healthcare as an example. So I, I was on a good career knowing everything about hormones, autoimmune, but uh, I said, we have a system failure in that. How could that be? Misdiagnosing, you could rescue multiple sclerosis, you could cure. The patient is cured until nowadays. You could not imagine that. But this was a single case. You cannot, uh, later on, I was convinced everything is Lyme disease for sure. That was my eyelids time. I learned from uh, Nick Harris, Igenics. I learned from Boris Cano. I learned from um, 2006. It was in Philadelphia, my first conference. Since that, I'm eyelids member also. Now I'm ILADF board, what you mentioned, the educational foundation. So I said, we have system failure. I mean, you need to do something. Give up your good position uh, at this uh, big laboratory group. Uh, all risk into Borreliose clinic. All risk into uh, better diagnostics. But we have these diagnostics. Why should we? Um, I rescued the patient with that. We have sensitivity. Maybe you could say 80, 90 percent. But this is pretty good for laboratory tests. The creatinine you do for kidney insufficiency has just 50 percent sensitivity. So this is um, an, a game changer. That was a game changer to me. And uh, but not everything is Lyme disease. I learned later on uh, about the co-infection, all of these stories uh, moving on. Now I'm on the viruses and parasites and yeast and mole field. So um, next chapter is opened. But what we need to accept what the patient is telling you and the test is so good, so good the clinician is in the clinical diagnosing in the differentials. And if you neglect that in Australia, you never will learn that. The community is simply stupid. The GPs don't know anything about Lyme disease. Mm. Yeah, it's a big job ahead of you. You've done so much, but there's so much more to go, isn't there? So this whole, you know, I can't, it's probably the most answer or most asked question in our inbox is trying to understand testing, the different types and the strengths and weaknesses of each. Is there a way to simplify that to people that don't have a medical degree? Oh, this is a challenge. You know, we start with Adam and Eve, um, very ancient times. So knowledge at universities is poor. It's blocked. It's not teach. It's not educated. It's not accepted. So it's like a big wall around us protected with the guidelines. So the ELISA, which was not designed uh, to diagnose Lyme disease, it's a, still a, a scientific test. So, but we, they used it from CDC and FDA, you know, that time. Um, the Western blot's not standardized. The ELISA are not standardized. We see so many with false negative ELISA, but positive immunoblots, Western blots, micro you know, so the antibodies are challenged. The whole pathogen is a challenge for the antibodies. Um, the T cellular diagnostics is um, more sensitive for sure, 20 to 200 fold. This is named the interferon gamma release assays, IGRA, which is represented uh, in the name of the ELIS board or ELISA technique. Uh, also, other companies now developing more the, um, the supernatant um, uh, techniques. Um, there's one company in England now developing that. Um, but nevertheless, um, the diagnostics is not bad. What we need to do, we need to check the antibodies, but not with ELISA, not with the Western blood, not with the immune blood. We diagnose the persistent forms, the round bodies nowadays with a tickplex. This is a, a test which was developed um, by Professor Gilbert Gilbert. Uh, she's Canadian, a uh, good friend of mine in, in New Vascular University um, 15 years ago. And she said, why not to check antibodies for round bodies, for L forms? 
forms for cysts for these persister forms, intracellular or better name it pleomorphic forms uh, scientifically. So, and um, she developed that tickplex basic and we, we, what we could say now, it closes the gap um, of the false negative antibodies um, to the persister form. So they persist as a lot of pathogens, spike proteins, uh, chlamydia, they all persist in us, uh, viruses. You, the question is, you would ask, could we eliminate them at all? That's a huge question. Um, in my in the mice model, Ambers did she eliminated them in the mice model, but she just checked for sensu stricto and uh, not for Garinia and Afzelia, which for sure has different complications intracellular and the, in the round bodies persister forms. So the neuroboliosis is more dominant. Um, but nevertheless, science is good to do. But what we need um, not better tests. We have fantastic tests. Uh, as an example, my tests are CAP accredited. So in July again, the CAP clinical MRI American pathologists coming to my laboratory from America, and they will check my test and will say, yes, you're doing wonderful tests. The Borrelia ailis spot is perfect. Bartonella is for, uh, perfect. So what do you want else with the test? We have good tests, but we need to use them. We need better clean education of the clinicians. That's the point, not the test. And then they need to correlate the test results with the clinical findings or better their acceptance. So long you don't accept, so long you will say, oh, this test is false negative. The, uh, this is the clinical false negativity they are doing, you know, clinically. Uh, the laboratory test is a test, you know, and uh, what I could tell you, the test is 99.9% .9 specific for this passage and not unspecific, not false negative, but this is the test sensitivity and the test specificity, which is different from the clinical sensitivity and the clinical specificity, which is done by the medical doctors. And if they are not accepting that, they do false negative interpretation of clinical symptoms and send you um, LDA patients to neuropsychiatric clinics and that's the end. Uh, so we don't come forward in this. We need to change the guidelines for sure. We need to uh, change the clinical uh, consciousness of the medical doctors, not of you. Patients know more than doctors and this is for doctors a horrible situation as you can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. So just again, to simplify it a little bit more, so the testing that's mandated in Australia and results that are accepted are the ones that are not sensitive enough to be really doing a good job on behalf of patients. Would that be accurate? When I uh, saw the cases, the uh, doctors who lost their licenses, uh, I would say this is unbelievable what's happening there. This is a criminal action against them, you know, because they did the clinical diagnosis. They said um, the uh, antibodies ELISA is bullshit in Australia, which is the truth simply the truth. So it's not the two-tier system. This is a very old-fashioned, um, also Western blood is a very old-fashioned method. We're doing now microarrays, which is uh, more linearity, a better measurement, a better comparison of the, but still what you put into a test system, you will find, you know, if you don't uh, to put Miyamoto as an example in the test system, you will not find Miyamoto. Uh, if you don't do B uh, Borrelia burgdorferi Lusitania into test system, you will not find it. That's always the problem you could discuss about cross reactions whatever in this um, uh, subspecies levels but on the other side uh, what you said um, the the problem is the two tier system with the ELISA and uh, this was also in 2006 my patient where I had this uh, positive ELI spot um, and the patient got cured you know so you take away options this is a criminal behavior of the medical communities in my opinion to damage Australian patients. Thank you, Dr. Schwartzbach. So there was another question that came in um, that's understanding the process of validation and what that means for doctors and their patients. Yeah, as I started a little with the explanation, we have a laboratory test validation in our laboratories, which is mm. the baseline for the European accreditation, which is named DAKKS in England, it's UCAS. They cooperate together and uh, the CAP accreditation for America and the rest of the world, Dubai, or so Emirates, they all need the CAP accreditation, we have that. Um, this is a validation process. So we check positive uh, samples where we know it, we compare that with other laboratories nearby and we find the same results and the clinical samples are characterized, um, but 
these are not the Australian patients, to be honest. <laughs> these are more the German patients around us um, because it's easier to get samples from there. So we have uh, also comparison with Western blood, immunoblood, stick blacks, and so um, a validation process is needed um, to get the test into an accreditation phase. Otherwise, you cannot accredit a test. Um, not all laboratories are cap accredited. You know, there's one in America, the biggest one, which is not cap accredited. They do in-house criteria, which is not the way we, we, we are allowed to do, you know, in Germany and the quality is high on top and the cap uh, is the same in America. It's the highest quality standard. So the a validation process is 100%, let me say so. But now we come again into the field of, of other countries. Um, the doctors are doing the clinical validation with their own patients, you know, and um, this is now the uh, clinical specificity validation and clinical sensitivity validation. And as I mentioned that, forget it in Australia, it's not accepted, so it's zero. Okay, so there's sort of blocks for, at every corner when you're looking at Lyme situation for Australians. So yes, yes, but but they uh, we need um, uh, yeah block. Um, I, I cannot tell you who's blocking that, you know. Um, but as I went to Canberra, you're correct. Um, uh, you are specialist for so-called Lyme disease, or in America, it's named a rare disease. Okay, you could laugh about that. It belongs still to rare diseases. When I went to Portendown to the Reference Institute in Germany okay, this is blocked. The problem may be why it's blocked. We have two different medical worlds, uh, maybe to bring it to compromise. We have the world in the hospitals with Bell's palsy, with strokes, with uh, caditis after tick bites. Maybe we have the world of pulsareches, which is a very fresh uh, thing. You know, we have this um, uh, stage one and two, but then we come into the discussion with the chronic world. What you guys mm -hmm. are telling, or patients are telling the doctors, I had Lyme disease maybe, and then I got treated for my bulsarech, and I thought everything is fine with me. And after two or three or four years, I got very bad symptoms. And then the discussion started. Could it be a reactivation or maybe a chronic persistence of Lyme disease, of Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen in your body? And we need to say, yes, it can persist. We find the persister forms with the tick plaques. Also for other infections, for chlamydia, mycoplasma, viruses, EBV, herpes, we know that. So SARS-CoV-2 brought us into that uh, the more acceptance of reactivations. Also, mm -hmm. um, Borrelia burgdorferi can be reactivated for sure. We have data about that uh, past uh, in long COVID patients. So we have a good chance now to change the communities. But so so long, it's the um, yeah maybe the um, guidelines and not respecting new literature blocked by the majority of doctors. This is maybe um, they say no 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 Lyme is a name it Lyme like illness or whatever. So what it, what is it? And then they invented uh, when I was in the middle uh, ten years ago they invented the name uh, post treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So what is it? Is it still an active infection or is it a syndrome? A syndrome is just a description of symptoms. It's it's not anything uh, demonstrating is it reactivation, is it chronic, or is it a, a new infection because you don't get can get you cannot get immunity against uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Antibodies are useless. They are not protecting. They try to, pro, uh, to develop now a vaccination, but who knows if it's really uh, protective as it is, was the problem with the different shifts and drift and antigenities of SARS-CoV-2. So we learned a lot about that. Awesome. Um, so for future of patients, you wanted me to talk about the what's in what's the hope or what the biggest goals are for the future of Lyme and co-infected patients. What questions do we need to answer yet? Or or do you think it's just, you know, we need to address health policy? <laughs> When I came to Canberra, I, I said clearly, you need to collect ticks from everywhere around the country. Uh, tick is not an epidemic. You know, some name it epidemic. It's more endemic. We name it hotspot as it started with the SARS-CoV-2 in hotspot in, in Italy or in Wuhan. These were the hotspots, the endemic areas. And then it spread it around as uh, in Australia, maybe European birds are transporting ticks on them uh, to North South Wales. And so you have more multiple sclerosis patients in this direction. So but it could be in your garden, but not in neighbor's garden, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi in the ticks, you know. So you need huge tick collections from different spots in the country. We, we started also in South Africa. 
Africa, uh, this project now with um, park rangers. And interestingly, Carl McManus was a park main, uh, ranger. Uh, you should check for different areas, um, but um, maybe you have in Australia a different subspecies, who knows, you know? So in Lyme-like illness, but this is not um, excluding uh, Lyme disease. In, in Bavaria, we have Borrelia burgdorferi uh, bavariensis. So this is Bavarian uh, style. We have Rickettsia helvetica, which came from Switzerland, Helvetica, Switzerland. So um, the origin could be more endemic, and this could be a, a key point uh, to collect many, many ticks, do different tick, ticks, uh, tick tests, a good um, PCR on that, uh, maybe multiplex on that, also checking for co-infections. I know that in Australia, Rickettsia is accepted as it is in Australia, but not uh, Lyme disease. So you need activities, you need to collect, you need to check, you need to do tick mapping. Um, nevertheless, this is not solving the education at universities um, to talk about that, uh, to differentiate, not just about Rickettsia, tick born or better vector born illnesses, you know, uh, to teach more about that. Um, so, and also we need case definitions. This is really problematic also in the studies doing clearly case definitions. What's a typical Lyme patient, you know? Um, Bulzaresh, we, we need not to discuss about that, but after that is something happening with your immune system, immune suppression, inflammation, and by that other pathogens are reactivated. So uh, what I've seen the last um, five, six years, more and more patients with reactivations of viruses. Uh, Justin Bieber, as an example, he suffered from Lyme disease, but uh, after a while they said he, he has also um, EBV infection, Epstein-Barr virus, and now they diagnose him with varicella soster reactivation, the ramsey hunt syndrome. This is varicella soster. And what I can tell you nowadays, from my perspective, not everybody is still suffering from Lyme disease. Um, uh, they started with a with a um, with a with a what is it named the uh, starter, but the menu came later on with a three I model. We have this model: infection, inflammation, immune dysfunction all over the world. CDC described that. We learned that from SARS-CoV-2. I was exactly on the way. Jack Lambert was on that way with two I models. Now. We are clearly convinced um, it's not all the pathogen. It's not all to use antibiotics. It's also to diagnose and treat uh, these three I. But what you need also a perspective. Um, yeah, uh, you need demonstrations uh, to go on the street, uh, to, as we do in Germany. <laughs> Again, the climate change. Uh, you need, but the, I know the patients are too weak. They are too sick for that, and they don't have the money for that. They have their own fights. They're in the in their own world. In the internet Wi-Fi sitting here the whole day, uh, information, disulfiram, is it good or not? In Amber's study, it was not good to, to use uh, disulfiram. Uh, in the combination, it could make sense again, or the Dapsone, also as a single therapy, no sense in her mice um, was published now, I think uh, very few weeks ago. Uh, so we have more and more evidence what we should do uh, also for you, but still we need um, a fair discussion with the authorities. I, I had some time with Richorowitz in Australia, but nothing happened, you know, and it's like um, how I name it uh, David versus Golia or, you yeah. know, Don Quixote, Don Quixote and the windmills, we run ag against uh, uh, the systems. <laughs> yeah. So that's a really important point you brought about three eyes. So to clarify, it's the infection and immune dysfunction and inflammation. And are they triggered by the original infection? Like, does, so Borrelia is known to be immunosuppressive, isn't it? Is that correct? I think, yeah, I, what, what we have seen also, um, SARS-CoV-2, we learned a lot, you know, also yeah. uh, my laboratory, we did hundred thousands of PCR cellular tests. It's named iSpot with interleukin-2 and interferon gamma. We did antibodies, IgG and IgA, we're still doing them. What we can say if a pathogen like Borrelia burgdorferi is the invader coming into your body, there's for sure um, some immune suppression and some inflammation. A bulsaresh is also an inflammation coming from the lymphocytes. Uh, so the Elispot uh, interferon gamma release assay, they are st strictly positive. They are detecting the lymphocytic infiltration in the von gamma release. So also CDC did a paper about that, that in the early, in the bulsaresh, it's much better <laughs> doing the Elispots than the antibodies. It's, it's ridiculous. They published in 2016 
that paper um, and it's CDC paper, you know, but nobody is following up that. I think it was blocked in the guidelines by the mic. Probologists, although it's CDC, and they said it's a good test to monitor that. Um, but what we can say, some of these patients, what we have found, they got vaccinated um, without any question, do they have pre-existing inflammation, pre-existing immune uh, suppression, immune dysfunction, pre-existing infections? Nobody was asking, maybe you have underlying uh, persistent, persistent forms of Lyme disease, persistent forms of herpes simplex virus, persistent forms of Bartonella, persistent forms of parasites, you know, nobody was checking the immune system before they did the vaccination. Okay, there was a lot of pressure on that. Um, and what we can say, a lot of patients have cellular immune deficiency, the CD3s are very low CD markers. Uh, so they have pre-existing chronic virus infection without knowing um, it's a Coxsackie virus, number one infection in the world with the echo virus, a double infection, um, which makes a lot of trouble. And it, this virus makes Lyme-like symptoms, you know, so uh, we need to differentiate it for sure. Uh, but I can tell you, if an invader, the pathogen is coming into it, you get an inflammation you, and you get also the coagulopathies, you know, you switch from um, mm -hmm. anticoagulant to procoagulant. So you get cold fingers, cold hand, you get strokes, you get thrombosis, you know, all of this, um, you get inflamed skin, uh, you um, maybe um, you get uh, still inflammation of the organ system of the gut, you are inflamed, the whole body is inflamed, you know, uh, this is a problem for all of us. And then you get the autoimmune disorders by that by the TH2. Uh, it's the dominant um, system after a while, the TH1 cellular immunity or cellular immune test going down, TH2 is dominating, TH 17 is coming, then you get Hashimoto's, Sjögren, whatever, collagenosis, mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis, you get a lot of these problems. Uh, by the way, we did a study in England, double prime controlled with fibromyalgia patients, and we found significant association with Borrelia burgdorferi in 30% and ANA positive fibromyalgia patients. Who knows that? Mm -hmm. Nobody of the rheumatologists. Uh, this is double blind control study, not uh, uh, prospective or so. Um, but all of these things, um, coagulation problems, inflammation, and in the end, we see also a lot of cancer patients now, because what we can say now, there's a lot of transformation of cells. Um, uh, Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi also is in some of this uh, cancer, cancerogenesis, as it is with the viruses, EBV, CMV, herpes simplex, HHV6, 7, 8, whatever, um, but uh, Bartonella with the breast cancer as an example, you know, so uh, pancreatic cancer, we have a lot of associations in the published literature, maybe single case reports, but also not to threaten your communities, but we need to keep an eye on that to find out uh, autoimmune disorders and cancer answer if it's possible that it could be an underlying infection which was reactivated which we need to treat for sure and diagnose and then to treat um, and the uh, last eye is the immune dysfunction so what I know a lot of these clinics are working with high dose vitamin C we work with glutathione vitamin D2 plus uh, K no sorry D3 plus K2 so the combination that all came into the focus during that SARS-CoV-2 crisis because everybody said we cannot do anything against the I said, yes, we need to do. And we have a lot of great herbs, but we have great success. Uh, Hotunia, which is very famous in Australia, Takuna, Stevia, Bandrol. Uh, these are the herbal antivirals and herbal antibiotics. So if nobody wants to help you with antibiotics in Lyme disease, um, in this, um, in this uh, problem of not acceptance, you could try it out yourself. But this is not a good therapy if you do something yourself. We need educated expert for that. Uh, we need expert for vector-borne diseases. That's a problem. Mosquito bites, uh, sand flies, they all can transmit these tick-borne illnesses as an example, but the doctors don't know that. Uh, so we need educated but on the other side, the immune system plays a really, really a massive role in this. Uh, when the invader is coming, we need good immune system. When we do vaccinations, we need a good um, immune system. And still we have this protein rest of uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which also can persist in the macrophages. Macrophages, monocytes are transporting it or can transport it everywhere in our body. And maybe in the end, um, the, the majority of doctors is correct in saying, oh, it's more inflammation. 
inflammation, but it doesn't matter. Then you need to care about the inflammatory part with the spike protein, with the Borrelia round bodies, the persistent forms. You need to care for that. You know, the vets are doing better medicine. You know, your koalas are better treated um, for chlamydia pneumonia as it is uh, for the park rangers. You know, chlamydia pneumonia, the aerogen, you have clinics for your koalas. You treat them with azithromycin. They have chronic fatigue. And then do you bring them back uh, to the to the to, to your trees in your background? So the koalas and, and these vets, they are 100 steps in front of uh, uh, human medicine for sure. So it's interesting what you're saying, because in Australia, I started to see some of the Lyme doctors reporting that long COVID is the exact same clinical picture as chronic Lyme. And you're saying that similar things are, are being reported internationally and, and that you're discovering the foundation of that through your testing. Is that correct? Um, yes, we. Um, I'm a clinician. You know, I, I'm coming from cancer. And cancer, you have a crading and a staging. A crading means if you're a doctor uh, doing the first time, you have a B symptomatic, you feel tiredness in cancer, you have night sweating cancer. As an example, you have B symptomatics. Um, if you don't have, you don't have it. Uh, you don't know where the cancer is. Uh, if you have blood in your stool, this need not to be a cancer. This could be uh, also some hemorrhoidal problems. But if it's in the stool, and these are all the key questions different and then I developed years ago, uh, before Rich Horowitz did his um, uh, huge, um, um, uh, uh, what is it named, his checklist, uh, the Horowitz checklist. I think this is really unspecific. This is not so helpful for us. We need more specific checklist. I said, why not to develop checklist for viruses, for parasites, um, for yeast mold, and uh, maybe also for multiple infections. And I did it, uh, this multiple infection checklist, in including Lyme disease also um, during COVID-19 in 2021, because it was pretty clear to me that this means a lot of reactivations of uh, different pathogens. Um, and this gives you, it costs nothing, you know, fill out this checklist, you know, it's easy. It's a clinical differentiation. It's high specific. It's evidence-based. It's, um, <laughs> you cannot do more clinical specificity. It's from the teaching books. You know, I did this work on it with HHV6, with the parasites. I have a parasitologist in my laboratory now, because I'm sure we have a lot of toxocarias toxoplasmosis, ascaris all over the world. And we need to check it in different parts of the, uh, con of the countryside, also in Australia. So um, because the patients all have a different symptom, uh, yeah, not a sy different symptom profile. Some are similar. Uh, as you mentioned, fatigue is not a typical Lyme disease, some joint arthritis. Uh, I could discuss also echovirus with you, or Yersinia or Campylobacter. Um, this is not specific, you know, I'm infectious disease doctor, not uh, heavy metals or, or not 5G. I know that plays also a role in this uh, triggering factors, but I want to know which infection is active in which patient. What we have seen that every patient with so-called chronic Lyme-like symptoms uh, is suffering from multiple infections in an individual profile. So we are profilers, like in criminal stories, infectious disease doctors like Jack Lambert, me, or caring about that. Um, and this is evidence-based medicine to differentiate, differentiate, not to say oh, everybody has no Lyme disease. This is where I started, or oh, everything is tick-borne illnesses. We have a lot of immunology behind that, a lot of inflammatory processes, but a lot of different profiles. And therefore, you use this checklist. Costs nothing. Long COVID checklist, post COVID, post. Uh, you can you cannot imagine how many of these patients um, uh, are thinking they have Lyme disease, but uh, still it's it's no longer Lyme disease. The starter came with Borrelia, maybe in a foreign country or whatever, not in Australia, maybe. And then the whole process is coming on with this opportunistic infections. It's the former HIV model we learned in the 80s with Freddie Mercury. HIV patients not dying from HIV virus directly. They die from opportunistic infections. 
HH36, Seven sarcoma, EBV, lymphoma, sarcoma, whatever they die from that, you know, immune suppression, inflammation, and they they cannot could not survive that. So we don't we treat it specifically cytomegalovirus, doing a colitis, uh, net uh, all of these infections. Maybe to summarize that, um, what I have learned the last years, uh, also during SARS-CoV-2, all of these infections, also SARS-CoV-2 influenza, they are doing mitochondrial pathies, chronic fatigue, they are doing leaky gut, they do foot uh, intolerances, they um, uh, bring a histamine release massively. So the histamine um, intolerance group belongs to us. Um, and it in the end, uh, it suppresses your CD3 cells, your CD56 cells, your CD57 cells. It's very immune suppressive to you. And then you need to build up the immune system and not using corticosteroids. They help you in the beginning because they are anti-inflammatory, but in the end, it's a worst case scenario to suppress your immune system and the doctors are doing it now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Schwarzbeck, is there anything that we haven't touched on in, you know, you want to touch on how to diagnose and treat in the complexity of all of this? So you've, you've really um, thoroughly explained the AI model of infection, immune dysfunction and inflammation. What's the path forward on treating? Like, do they have to treat all the co-infections or is there an order in which they should treat? No, the first step is to treat the gut. The gut means 80% of uh, our immune system, okay? Or more the microbiome, they name it. Um, in the gut, there are different pathogens, Yersinia, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Coxsackie, and Echovirus active, Cytomegalovirus. We have that problem, inflammation, leaky gut. Um, I think if we have a good nutrition, that's the first step. A good lifestyle, no stressing factors. All of these infections are stress triggered. The cortisol plays a role, the dopamine, the also pregnenolone. You cannot imagine how many also of uh, male and female have pregnenolone problems or DAGAS. Um, you need uh, also testosterone. You need also to care of, about the hormonal axis. You know, it's uh, this is a challenge. Uh, but the gut, the nutrition plays a role for sure. So now you could ask me what is a healthy nutrition. I could tell you clearly what not to eat, huh? uh, not your red meat, so you don't get a red meat allergy from this alpha gal from the ticks. So a red meat, all meat is forbidden. Mm -hmm. You can eat a wild fish. This is the only protein is allowed. So um, it's not allowed to eat any kind of wheat, okay? Um, it's not allowed to eat pasta, pizza. Um, it's not allowed sweets. It's not allowed any al alcoholics. And if you follow up these rules inflammation is going down immune suppression detox pathways are better for sure from your liver and your kidney if you don't drink drink anything so then you should start with this part of your nutrition that costs you nothing you know this is you don't need a therapist um it's a we name it a basic therapy uh, also a nutritional therapy also uh, it's not allowed to drink water with gas uh, just water without gas and very very purified water no plastics in it, microplastics, um, no heavy metals in it. Uh, you need good filters. We have in Germany, as an example, the best water filters. Uh, um, I don't know if it's around the world, but you have good filters. Um, and the gut um, plays a very important role. If you don't change your nutrition, you feed the bugs, you know, uh, you feed your bad situation. Uh, also go on the free nature, go outside ozone, oxygen, all of these therapies are helpful. Um, we have now a tendency doing Ephoresis in Germany, Inuspheresis it's named, or the HELP Ephoresis with Professor Jäger. We are cooperating closely with her. The Ephoresis helps you uh, because all of these pathogens doing biofilms, and this is very, very important to use biofilm breakers. To me, natokinase is the best one, natokinase, um, mm -hmm. maybe serapeptase or lumprokinase or biodisrupt, but I, I am taking myself against my uh, infections, um, the natokinase. You know, um, this is from nature. Um, and the antibiotics have the problem also long term, you destroy 
the gut completely. You are coming into a one-way street, you destroy the gut, and if you reactivate more viruses, more parasites, more yeast and mold, and then you, you need flunazole, flugonazole as an example for candida. Uh, you live in a house where it's a lot of mycotoxins, you know, so um, and the surroundings play a role. We have a lot of problems in Vancouver region, and I have a lot of naturopathic doctors there. They tell me the houses are so contaminated with yeast and mold, so we need to treat this and not Lyme disease in the first line, although the patients have Lyme disease or in a combination. You need to know what to treat. Um, but the point is, in this holistic approach, um, we need a lot of knowledge of the therapist, which is not given. Uh, some are experts for ozone, some are experts for hyperthermia, some are experts for this. We need a complete concept in this 3i model. We need more clinics. They are coming now more in Europe, in Germany, and also uh, now in, in Romania, we found one. So, and in Poland, they are more coming now, but they also attack these clinics. Um, so, we need a holistic approach. Um, if you have a good therapist in this, this is not your GP. Your, your GP doesn't have the time, doesn't have the knowledge. He cannot do that. But you can start with a good nutrition, with a good lifestyle, not so much stressed, um, go out in, in the fresh air. These are, it, it looks uh, it sounds a little easy to do, but these are all of the game changers for you, maybe. There are good books about that, um, about Lyme diet uh, from uh, different authors. You could buy that. Um, you have good options to treat it. And to me, uh, we find so many other pathogens that um, antibiotics are um, not so helpful if they don't help you within two, three months. I talked with Joe Boroscano years ago about that in uh, the conference. And he said, I mean, uh, change your concept if it's not working two, three months and antibiotics don't stuck in one way street with a dead end. Uh, please check for other reasons. Maybe it's not Lyme disease. It's a co-infection. It's Bartonella you need to treat or Babesia or some other infections. Or it's a different reason. Don't stuck in that uh, way. Uh, two, three months for one therapy option is really good enough. If you have Herxheimer's during that time, you feel worse the first weeks or it's coming and going, then it's good track. You do longer antibiotics, but not, uh, I, I'm taking now 10 years, Dapzone, Dapdomycin, oh, okay, but I I feel a little better, but it's coming back, okay, but you didn't have solve uh, your immune, Im immune dysfunction, you didn't have solve your inflammation, and maybe there are other infections you're not treated for. So uh, Ivermectin also became famous during SARS-CoV-2 uh, as an example. Um, to me now, the, the good options we have in the nature, we have a lot of herbs, as I mentioned, some of them. Uh, we have also the good vitamins, we have the minerals. Um, we have also options in treating maybe some patients with virostatics in combination with antibiotics, could also help the valaciclovir, ganciclovir. We have some good experience also with that because uh, SARS-CoV-2 plays also a role in this, you know, and a lot of us had vaccination and a lot of us had the infection like me myself omicron that time so we need also a good lifestyle but uh, in the end uh, the pathogen also needs to be treated the infection i don't want to, to go away from antibiotics um, but it's not helpful two or three months it's really enough what a wealth of knowledge you are dr schwarzfeld so where's the hope for australia where do you see what should we focus on to bring hope for patients? Yeah, there's a lot of hope. You know, the hope will not die. We we uh, we will fight together this um, Lyme fight. Uh, I, I name it a fight. We we don't give up. Um, Lyme is in the focus for sure. The ticks are in the focus. Um, we need to be a little careful to overinterpret Lyme disease, to overdiagnose it, and to misdiagnose it. Uh, the truth is in the middle always, you know. Um, we need um, to bring the consciousness in Australia more into the field of this tick bone. We need to start with something. Uh, so we have postulations. We need uh, not aggressiveness. Um, we need uh, papers. We need science, science 
science. So we are doing now a lot of, uh, not a lot, but um, the, we do scientific work, uh, but we need more of that like Ambers is doing. We need these guys, perfect, like Professor Gilbert, uh, Gilbert. We need also um, studies about Elispot. I, I have now 12 uh, really good high rank papers now uh, on PubMed listed. Uh, so we need double blind control studies. It's not enough case reports for sure. Uh, we have still the referees problems in the papers. It's two versus one. Uh, they, uh, two of the referees in this papers block the papers. That's also a problem. Um, name it corruption, whatever, or they are not neutral. Um, uh, we have this system, you know, so, but it's not just uh, a lob or name it lobbyism. Maybe it's more the correct word in Germany also for some lobbyistic structures. The politicians play a role. Uh, politicians are need to be changed. We need you. And um, without you, Sharon, and your group, uh, we doctors uh, in Australia will be nothing, but we will never give up together. Sharon oh, is muted. Yeah, muted. Sorry, apologies that I was my internet just froze. So um, that's an awesome overview of what we can focus on. And, and especially, I think, Dr. Schwartzbeck, for people who can't get medical care right now, which is probably the majority coming into our inbox, the, you know, the reference to herbal medicine is so potent and so important. And we got some amazing Lyme naturopaths in Australia and around the world. So that's also hope for people uh, who may be patients watching this later down the track. So Dr. Schwartzbeck, I know we both agreed over the last few days corresponding on this that neither of us are quitting and that's the only, you know, one of the only ways forward. Um, what would you like to leave people with today from your heart for Australians watching this? I have a tip for you. Uh, don't name it Lyme disease. Name it maybe I have a mycoplasma chest infection or chlamydia pneumonia chest infection. You say, I have bronchitis and so. And then the treatment is the same as it is with Lyme disease. Just a tip for you. you know? uh, this is more accepted. If you go to a pulmonologist and say, okay, I prescribe you some antibiotics, which is doxycycline, it's better than to do nothing. You know, If you have Lyme disease, uh, this is tricky, um, uh, but also ridiculous in the end. Um, for your Australian patients, um, there is still hope. And um, you have a very conservative system. So um, we need um, also to support you stronger. The question is how we can do that. Uh, we need strategies. And um, I know that LDAA is very, very active in this. We need maybe doing some webinars. We need to invite some doctors and to show just evidence-based paperwork. So the key is you. You put the pressure on the medical doctors for sure. Uh, we can educate them. We need to start with something. Um, I, I would in, enjoy to do a diagnostic webinar with uh, some doctors who are interested. And then we discuss it, not promotion not promoting, okay, not promoting my laboratory. Um, this should not be done. We just saying, okay, this is the weakness of the ELISA. We have 17 pages, why the ELISA is false negative of evidence-based literature. And then we could show and discuss. And, and this is the key, we could try it, you know. Uh, we will not come into um, the reference institutes so easily because they are still blocking it, as you named it. University yeah. world is different than the world outside, but the GP or naturopaths, um, we don't want to risk them. We say, okay, name it maybe Lyme-like illness, treat the inflammation, treat the immune system, use some naturopathic pathways better than nothing. Uh, also, this could be done. I have also some information for you about how to treat this 3i. Uh, so, but uh, maybe a community of other experts and not so, so self-promoting, you know. We need a neutral and a lot of evidence-based literature behind that. Otherwise, Otherwise, we will not uh, get the doctors back to us and not to risk them. That'd be awesome. Um, and Dr. Schwarzbeck, I think um, it's really important that um, these patients hear advocacy from people who are as knowledgeable. It's like sitting, sitting at the feet of giants. You know, congratulations and thank you for all you've done and continue to do in the world of tick-borne disease science. And um, we'll look forward to speaking with you again, see if we can organize some of those medical trainings. 
Thank you, Sharon. Without you and LEAA, Australia would be nothing in the world of uh, Lyme and co-infections. Thank you for your hard work. I know that. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that.